I know Kung Fu. Show me. So, so I know Kung Fu. Whoa. Show me. So today we'll learn um, how to simplify and power up your Rails apps uh, using a graph database. But first, let's look at what the current database landscape looks like. Um, we're going to start with the lower complexity. So, and by lower complexity, I mean not very connected databases, uh, but high volume, like a key value store. And this is something like you know, React, um, Redis, Memcast, KC, that kind of stuff. And it's used for like session data or monitoring or you know, um, huge catalog stuff. And you have Columnar. Um, which is a little bit more structure, something like HBase or Cassandra. Um, and uh, I think HBase was uh, made by uh, Google. So you use it for like search engines and stuff like that. And then document databases, which is a little bit more structure, but then you have uh, the notion of collections, uh, MongoDB and CouchDB. And you use those for like health records and insurance and stuff like that. And then the, the one that we're most familiar with is the relational database. and um, this is, you can use it for something simple or something very complex. Um, and you know, you have My MySQL or Postgres um, or Oracle. Um, and you can use it for stuff like banks or, like I said, anything. So the question is, where, where does a graph database fit here? And the, the answer is a, a, a graph database is as general purpose as a relational database, but you can, you can actually treat it as a um, key value store, or you know, as each node could be a document. Um, so, in a sense, a graph database is like a superset of all these databases, which is pretty cool. Um, and of course, when I talk about a graph database, I'm talking about a way of storing data, a data structure in a graph, right? So, if you're familiar with linked lists, or you should be anyway. If not, that's okay. I wasn't familiar with it until I went to college. Uh, trees, and then a more general purpose data structure is a graph. And that allows you, since it's so general purpose, that allows you to store that in, in it um, however you want, which is pretty cool. So let's go, let me show you just a quick example of a relational, um, uh, how you would do stuff in a relational database. So say you have a users uh, table, then you have an interest table, and then you want to, you know, see what 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 user has what interests, right? So you would say, I'm going to start with this user. I'm going to look up this user ID in the user interest table, and then correlate that to find the interest. Very straightforward. Very familiar with this. So let's go from thinking relational to thinking more like relationships. And we what we do is we kind of spread these. Uh, nodes out, as we're going to call it nodes. And we're, going to, and we're going to connect them with these relationships or edges. And then we're going to say, I'm going to start with this user, and I want to know what this user is directly connected with, and those are my, um, my interests, and that's it. See, a graph database focuses on the relationships between the data and rather than the commonality among values, you know, foreign keys and stuff like that. So, and this meshes very naturally with the way that we think about, uh, or, or, or the way that we humans conceptualize data, right? We think of families, our families as trees. We think of our friends as a graph, right? So um, most of us don't imagine personal relationships as self-referential data types, right? We don't think about, oh, this is my foreign key over here, you know? You're, you're, you're thinking more in, in terms of, um, of a graph, right? So, and what I've been describing here is, technically a property graph. And a property graph has nodes, it has relationships, and then it has properties on both. And that's important because that makes both the nodes and the relationships first class citizens, right? So you can put uh, a key value store, uh, and that's a property in both a relationship and a node. Relationships are also typed. So a relationship uh, could be something like I follow you, right? And then a different type of 
relationship could be you block me, right, because I'm being annoying or whatever. So, so it's typed and it's directed as well. More on that later. So I'm gonna go, you know, you may be thinking right now, man, lunch was very good. Or you may be thinking, I wanna know more about graph databases. So I'm gonna use a graph to describe a graph. A graph records data in nodes, it records data in relationships. A relationship organizes a node. A node, uh, nodes have properties and relationships have properties, right? So, and you can see that also the relationships are directed here. Uh, so they have a sense of direction. Uh, in most of the cases, you don't care about direction, but uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it's schemaless, it's, it's, the, it's up to you how, you how you structure stuff in a graph database. So again, what, what could we use this for? I've been asked this question a lot, um, and it may or may not be obvious to you that you know, this is very much so like a social graph, right? I follow you, you follow me, it's, it's very um, obvious. But there's so many more um, things that you can do. And this is just, I mean, barely the tip of the iceberg. Uh, monitoring, routing, and by routing I mean something like, like network packet routing. You can, you can say where has this packet been, and then you can basically track all the points in that. Uh, and uh, your brain, genealogy, all kinds of stuff, it's, it's very cool. And what's most exciting about this, just up, up to a few years ago, there wasn't really an easy way for us to kind of get a hold of a, uh, a graph database that we could deploy to easily. And of course, in came Neo4j, the J is for Java, and um, it's a property graph. Again, it's nodes and relationships and properties on both. It's, it's perfect for like complex, highly connected data, right? So that's why they call it a, a whiteboard friendly. So basically what they say is like, if you can draw it on a board, then you can represent it and you can capture it in the, in the database and, and store it that way, which is pretty cool. It's very scalable. I think it's, uh, it's supposed to be able to take 32 billion nodes and 32 billion properties sorry, 32 billion relationships and 64 billion properties. Lots of billions of stuff there um, that you can fill up, so very cool. And then the most exciting part is that it has a REST API, and therefore it also has a, Neo4, uh, sorry, a Neo4j Heroku add-on. So you could, right now, spin up a Sinatra app or spin up a, um, a Rails app and start messing with this stuff and you know, kind of tinkering with it and deploying it. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Now, when Neo4j was created, it wasn't created you know, as an as a, uh, academic exercise, it was more created out of necessity. These guys in Sweden uh, had a relational database and they were trying to solve a problem and what they decided to do was create a sample uh, social graph to kind of track their progress as they were gonna build it, right? Um, and basically it was gonna be a thousand person social graph with an average of 50, 50 friends per person. And the query was gonna be, does, is, does, does a path exist between person A and person B, right? And, and this is basically uh, the, the small world phenomenon, you know, that you can reach anybody with, within six degrees, or the Kevin Bacon path, everybody's familiar with that. Kevin Bacon, six degrees of Kevin Bacon is awesome. Um, and, not to, and not to say that you couldn't do this in SQL, there's you know, lots of ways that you could do this in SQL, like recursive SQL, to be very inefficient, but you could do it. You could do it uh, using a closure tree, but it's, it just adds a whole bunch of overhead and uh, space that, you know, why would you do that if a graph database does it for you and naturally, right? Before I move forward, I wanted to show you a way to do this in Postgres using uh, recursive SQL. It's pretty ugly. And uh, let me point out, does this thing work? Oh, it disappears. Union all should be like the worst thing that you could do. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna remove it from the screen because it's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Um, so, so here we go, right? What were the benchmarks that these guys uh, were getting? So for a relational database, it took on average, you know, to do that query, it took on average two seconds, 2,000 milliseconds. And on Neo4j, it took two milliseconds, which is pretty awesome. Um, and now whenever they increased the sample size to like millions of, of, of records, 
the, the MySQL database didn't even finish, right? And I'm not saying that the, the SQL that I showed you is what they used, because they were using MySQL and the sample that I used was Postgres. But the point is, in Neo4j, is still with the millions of, of, of records, still two, two milliseconds, which is pretty cool. And if you ask me, it's dogs all the way down, baby. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> or is it lions all the way down? <laughs> I'm confused. You're lost, care, and confuse me. Anyway, which brings me to my next point. It doesn't really. It does. <laughs> so <laughs> my next point is, is um, interacting, right? So the key to understand why it took um, the same amount of time in a, in a, with millions of records versus you know, thousands of records uh, comes to, to us by the way on how we traverse the graph, right? And so bear with me with the syntax here, and I'm going to talk to you about it later. So the syntax says start with n. Uh, you're assigning n the result. So you're finding node, and the, the, the users there is a, an index with a key value of name and Morpheus, right? So you find Morpheus, and you want to say, I want uh, match n, and then everything that's between you don't care. So you don't want his direct um, uh, connections. You want his friends of friends, that's a, a foe there. And then you want to return that. And what that gives you is you know, his immediate network. So it doesn't matter how, many, how big this is. It can be 50 or 100. Um, his immediate network can be 50, right? Because Remember, in the, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I forgot to mention, on the, on, the, on the query, instead of doing six degrees of separation, they were doing just four degrees of separation. So it's, it's a finite number. Um, so you're not going to go more than four deep, right, on, on finding this stuff. So let's say Morpheus' network is just 100. Because they're all directly connected, it doesn't matter how big the graph is. It can be millions of, of, of nodes, or it can just be 200 nodes. Since you're starting at a node and then you're, tra you're walking the graph or traversing the graph from there, it doesn't, it doesn't care about how big the rest of the stuff is. So that's why it only took two milliseconds. Um, what you saw there is Cypher, which is the query language. Uh, it's pattern matching. Um, it has a declarative grammar with clauses, kind of like SQL. And uh, it, you use it to mutate. You can create, you can delete, you can update. You can do aggregations and ordering all that stuff. And I'm going to show you some examples in a minute. Let's start with a real uh, example, with a real graph. Uh, everybody's familiar with the Matrix movies, right? Yeah. Believe it or not, there's somebody at HashRocket, I'm not going to name names, that has never seen the movies, which I was like, what? <laughs> really? Anyway, so um, Neo needs to save the world, and he needs to find the key maker, right? So you're going to start at Neo, and you're going to say, Neo knows the location of Morpheus, who knows the location of the Oracle, who knows the location of the Merovingian, who knows the location of the key maker. This is a pretty straightforward graph and pretty boring, actually. So let me throw in some more details in here, because, again, we can add properties to both. It's the cool stuff. So now we know that Neo is, is, is a human who knows the location of uh, Morpheus and the locations of Nebuchadnezzar. And the disclosure is public. And then Morpheus is a human who knows the location of the oracle who's a program, right? And the location is the matrix, and the disclosure, again, is public. So the oracle knows the location of uh, the Merovingian, which is in Club Hell. That's what it was called. I'm not even kidding you. Club Hell. Um, and the Merovingian, and the Merovingian knows the location of the keymaker, which he's holding him captive in a Windows server. <laughs> I may or may not have made that up. But, but anyway, the disclosure is secret, because he's holding him captive, right? And so uh, he, you know, Neo's mission, should he choose to, uh, no, it's a different movie. Um, so here's how you would create the stuff. Right? You, create, you create a node in Cypher like this, very simple. It's, it's going to look very similar to, to SQL. So Neo, and then you, and you, you, you assign that. The only reason we're assigning it to Neo is so we can return it. You could just say create and then that, um, that hash, and then it will just return the ID and then the hash that you just created. And that's how, that's how easy it is to create a node in the console. Um, to create a relationship, again, you find the nodes that you're interested in, the start and the end node, and then you say create. 
you say Neo, no location of, you pass in the properties that you want, and then you say Morpheus, and then you're good to go. And then you return R, and then it will look something like this. I guess it gives you the no location of is the type of relationship, the ID, and then its properties. Pretty straightforward. Um, yes. So to, to now to query what you, we just created, we want to know um, Neo's immediate network, right? So basically his first degree network. You would say, excuse me, uh, you, you, you find, so you got to start with a node, remember? And then you say, I want to match everybody who is Neo's immediate network. And then it will return Morpheus, because if you remember, that's it. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to just be, it can just be one linear thing. For simplicity's sake, I just left it like this, but you know, out of, out of Neo, Neo knows the location of Trinity, you know, because they're, you know, they hooked up and whatnot. <laughs> and um, Neo knows the location of, you know, Tank and all the other guys that are cool in the first movie. And then whatever happened on the other two, I can't remember. But you know, Neo and all, so, so there's more, so this, this, um, this result would probably be larger. You will have more nodes here to, to, to know who, who's, uh, that Neo's first in immediate network, right? Cool. So to get the path to the key maker, so if you want to do like a straight line all the way to the key maker, you would say something like, start with Neo, right? And then give me, you do something like this uh, cool looking syntax here that you say, no location of star one dot dot four, so you want to go four deep. Because if you remember, it's one, two, three, four, all the way down. And then and you, re and you can return just parts, just like a, a, a property from the relationship. And it would look something like this, right? So this becomes uh, Neo's to-do list of who he, who he needs to go find. Right? Morpheus, Oracle, Merovingian, Keymaker, Save the World, check, we're done. Um, and what you've been seeing here, this is just a, a weird screenshot, uh, of the Neo4j um, console, web admin console, and you can like write all this stuff and create it all by hand if you wanted to. There's also on the tab next to it, which I didn't have a, a site for that, but you can go check it out. Uh, it is localhost. Uh, on your localhost, you can install this very easily with brew, or you can install it with um, some other gems. Uh, you can visualize the data, right? It's pretty cool, but I'm not going to go into that. I am going to go into how you will implement this using Rails, right? Now, if you're using JRuby, then Neo4j.rb, there's a gem that basically replaces, basically replaces Active Record. But at that point, what happens is that your, the graph database becomes your only data, data um, whatever you call that thing, database. However, um, now, Neo4j implements, uh, Neo4j.rb implements active model and parts of active record. So, you know, it will be very similar, like has and and all that kind of stuff. You can do all that stuff, and that's cool. Um, but what if I told you you can have both? Because in most cases, realistically, you're going to have um, a polyglot database environment. You're not going to want to just say, hey, everybody, you're going to only use a graph database for everything now. Forget about anything else. Because realistically, that's not, it's not practical. And you want to leverage a graph database for what it's good for. In the case, um, in my case, we, we, just, uh, we have a uh, client that we are in uh, closed beta right now that they, they needed to, to track degrees of separation. So Postgres was our system of record. And then we had the things that matter to us synchronizing um, with, with the Neo4j database. And then that way, we were able to just use the Neo4j, the graph database, for you know, measuring the degrees of separation. And then the rest of the stuff, the bulk of the stuff, was still happening with um, uh, you know, Postgres and stuff like that. So, so yeah, so if you're not using JRuby, which um, is, is you know, it's been my experience that I, you know, I haven't been able to use JRuby yet on a, on a uh, project, then the REST API is what you want to use. You know, you want to hit the REST API. And there's, and there's a handful of uh, Ruby gems that, that wrap that, the REST API. The first one that we started with was Neography, which is a very thin wrapper. Uh, there's another one called Architect for R. And then, of course, my favorite one is called Keymaker, mostly because I wrote it. Uh, 
<laughs> it's, it's actually uh, still a work in progress. It's pretty uh, in its infant state. We extracted it from uh, the project that I was talking to you guys about. And then and what it aims to be, KeyMaker aims to be a multi-layer Ruby wrapper, right, for Neo4j <laughs> and hamburger. Um, so the first layer interacts with Neo4j REST API raw request. So I'm talking about like the, everything, basically it tries to implement at the lowest level every request that you can make to the Neo4j REST API, right? And then the second layer binds those raw requests uh, into Ruby objects. And then finally, the top layer uh, implements parts of active model or imp implements active model and treats those nodes and relationships as bona fide Ruby objects. Now, so as, as you go higher in the stack, then, then it becomes a little bit more rigid, right? Because at the very lowest level, a graph database, you can, it's schemaless, so you can do whatever you want. Uh, the properties are whatever properties you want to do. And, but as you go higher up in the uh, stack, then it becomes a little bit more structured. And that's okay, you know, because you want some structure. Hamburger. Uh, sorry, it was just a random thought. So, what would it look like? And this is, again, more code. Am I boring you guys with code? Cool, all right, here we go. Um, so the program, because we have, we have programs and we have humans, you would say include, include KeyMaker node, right? And then you would give it a property. So now this, this object can only have a name, even though you, can, you could technically create more properties. Um, you're now making it a little bit more rigid or more structured by giving it a name. And then you say, I want to create an index called programs. And then I want that to be on name, or you can do it on name and on email or whatever else, right? And now, this is a very uh, weird and long way of, it's like a find by SQL type thing. That, uh, it's a real weird way of creating a, a, a relationship, and I'm gonna show you a different way to do it later, but I wanted to show you that you could actually execute the cipher. So you would write the cipher like I was showing you earlier, and then um, you can, you know, you, know uh, you, you see the name over there, that's how you pass stuff into it, and then you, you pass a, it's very similar to, to, these, to the, the hash syntax that you can pass in when you're doing a word class in Active Record. So then you execute the cipher, and then it, you know, it creates the, the, the relationship. An easier way to do this is to dig, the cool thing about Neo, uh, the KeyMaker is that it, it allows you to use all the parts. And at every point in the, in, the, in the three layers, you can go and dig down and use this lower level call um, to the REST API, right? Create relationship, which you say, you pass in the type, you pass in a start node, you pass in an end node, and then whatever properties, and you're done. It's a lot cleaner than this, right? And I mean, I guess eventually the goal is to be a little bit more, to kind of abstract all this stuff out and, and be a little bit more active record-like for KeyMaker, but for now it works and it's pretty cool. This is the same thing basically for humans, right? So. So program and then humans, the same thing. And then if you want to get, for the humans, if you want to get the first degree network, for that instance, you would just, for this, you have to kind of do this. Uh, you can't really hide this. So you need to get, this is how you get the first degree network. And uh, it uses the instance's name. So to find to where you're starting, and then it says, give me all the network stuff. And then that gives you the network, the first degree network. Now the fourth degree network, it's different than getting all, all of them at the same time. You, you want to get only the fourth network. You would do something like this, right? Uh, start with me, uh, who knows the location of the first, who knows the location of the second, who knows the location of the third, and finally, who knows the location of the fourth, right? And then you execute that cipher, and you pass in the name and all that stuff, and then you're good to go. So you would say, I'm going to create Neo. I'm going to create all these other guys, right? Or find them, create them and find them. And now you have all these. Uh, uh, variables, and then you can say, I'm going to create all the relationships. You know, basically, we're creating the, the graph that I was showing you by doing this stuff. And then eventually, finally, you just say, give me Neo's first degree network, and then give me the fourth network, which would give you eventually a key maker, and you're done. That's it. You're good to go. So questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the question was, what kind of uh, issues have we had synchronizing uh, Postgres with the graph database, Neo4j? And what we do is we, we basically keep a um, Neo4j ID in Active Record, so in Postgres, and we have, um, in, we have the opposite. In, in the graph database, we have an Active Record ID. And as a matter of fact, KeyMaker does that for you, uh, keeps that stuff in sync. Um, it has, it, and how to keep them in sync? We, we use observers. Probably wouldn't do that again. Probably use something else, um, some, some other way of doing it. Um, but, but yeah, it's, 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 it's part of the challenge of having a polyglot uh, database environment. But it's, it's, it's worth doing because it really simplifies how you would, I mean, think about creating that crazy union all uh, SQL that would be insane, right? So. Any more questions? Wow, did I just speed through it? Yeah, what's up? Would I not want to use a graph database? Since it, it's so, it's so general purpose that you could use it for everything and it's pretty performant. Um, I can't really think of a, I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you to go and only use a graph database because it's just not realistic, right? Um, but I just can't think of anything that you couldn't do in a graph database. So it, it's pretty cool um, once you start thinking in that way because, again, it, 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 it maps real close to, to how we think. What's up? So how do you make things graph Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, so the question is, how do you uh, maintain referential integrity very carefully? <laughs> yeah, I mean, because again, you know, that's part of the uh, of the pain points, right? That you have to make sure that you, your your Rails app. Uh, well, I guess that would that could be the um, responsibility of KeyMaker, right? Or, or the library that you're using to keep those two things synchronized. And and I will keep that in mind. And by the way, KeyMaker um, is. That's, my, that's, that's where it is, so if you want to fork it and take a look at it and, and stuff uh, and help me out, that'll be great. Um, again, it's, it's kind of, what, what I've been focusing on with Travis, we've been working on it together, is we've been trying to get all the low-level requests done, so the first layer to be, um, you know, tested and all that stuff, and then kind of move up, you know, because right now all three layers are there, but layer two and layer three are a little bit, you know, not all the way um, finished and stuff like that. Yes, over there. Yeah, it does, and that, that's with Cypher. Now, uh, it's worth mentioning that they do have a different, uh, so Cypher is very expressive, as you saw, it's, it's very verbose, and I don't mind that, I actually like that. The, the counter, uh, plugin that they had. They had two plugins going. They had Cypher and they had Gremlin. Gremlin is like very, very concise. Like G is a graph. Dot, capital V, parens is the entire graph. It's very, 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 maybe I'm getting that wrong. But anyway, it's very concise. Um, so concise that it's kind of cryptic at times. But it still works and you can still use it. And, uh, you know, you can do all the algorithms and stuff like that, like breadth first or, you know, depth first and all that cool stuff. So, uh, yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Oh, how do, oh, well, the way that we did it is we did it with observers. So any time that there was a save or uh, a repeat. Say what? Sorry, the question was, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Yes, there, there are transactions in graph databases. So are there transactions with graph databases and how do you synchronize them with Postgres? The way that we did it is we use observers. So every time something was updated on Postgres, it was synchronized with, um, with a graph. Now, we, would, we could recreate the graph database with everything that was on Postgres. And that's how we kind of say, that's what we said that Postgres was a system of record, right? Cool, have time for one more question. Who's going to be the lucky winner? 
Nobody. Cool. Oh, yes. Uh, right now, it's, uh, it had like 12 or 15,000 nodes. And so, so the nodes start to multiply because in the properties, then it's like, you know, because each node could have properties and then the relationships can have properties. So, yeah. Right now, it's about that because we're still testing it locally. The Neo4j guys could probably give you better. Um, they're, they're really good. They're, they're an awesome community. They're re very helpful guys. That Neo Technology is the parent company, uh, kind of like Basho, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the React company, kind of like that. So Neo Technology is the parent company of, of Neo4j, but it is open source, so. Cool. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, databases, read this book, it's pretty cool, seven databases in seven weeks. I think somebody uh, else mentioned seven programming, seven languages in seven weeks. This is pretty cool by Eric Redman and Jim Wilson. Um, yeah. So thank you. <laughs>